This is Salma Shemmel for the group room in Chicago at the annual AACR meeting, the American Association of Cancer Research. Joining me now is Dr. Jose Basalga, Associate Director and Chief of Hematology Oncology at the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Hello, Dr. Basalga. Hi, Salma. How are you? I'm fine, thanks, and I appreciate you making time. This is a busy meeting for you, and you're going to give us a recap of what you think are some of the real highlights coming out of this AACR meeting. We have seen a lot of uh, clinical trial data being presented here, and some of them uh, with new compounds that are very exciting. So we've seen new things in breast cancer, uh, prostate, uh, ovarian carcinoma. So there's a variety of them. I think the theme uh, that is uh, joining all these presentations is the uh, novelty of the targets that are being uh, explored. Uh, if I may give you some examples, um, one that was quite interesting is um, there is a subtype of lymphoma uh, that is very refractory to therapy. It is an ABC diffuse large cell lymphoma. That tumor is not sensitive to chemotherapy quite frequently. And we had in the plenary session uh, Dr. Lou Stout from the NCI presenting amazing data with a new inhibitor against a kinase called BTK. Um, dramatic responses, patients that had failed multiple lines of chemotherapy, achieving complete remissions. So I think this class of agents is going to be a game changer in B-cell hematological uh, malignancies. I, I, I spoke with him and I said, how would you put that in context? And, and, and he was terribly excited, and they are working on finding a, a signature for this. So on one hand, therefore, great news on the lymphoma front with a new target. We also had some exciting data with new agents against prostate cancer, new anti-androgen uh, anti receptor agents that are working in patients that are um, resistant to hormone therapy. Uh, that was a phase one study presented. Would these be more advanced prostate cancer patients? Exactly. So these are patients that are advanced, that are refractory already to conventional hormone therapy. Again, with very exciting activity. You mentioned ovarian cancer a bit ago. What were some of the studies that came right. to light here? So there was um, uh, an interesting study that was presented by the GOG. That's a large uh, gynecological oncology group. Very very productive and, and they work together very nicely. And they had a subgroup of um, tumors that are the low proliferation ovarian carcinoma, the low grade serous uh, ovarian cancer. And these tumors have a number of mutations in the MEC uh, pathway. And what MEG? they. MEC, uh, M E K, MEC uh, pathway. Um, that's downstream from RAS, so it's RAS, RAS, RAF, MEC. And they've been working with a compound uh, that is a MEC inhibitor. And they showed um, some nice clinical benefit. It was a randomized trial, and some patients received the drug, some patients did not. And the patients that received the drug um, had clinical benefit responses, uh, you know, disease prolong prolongation of disease. Uh, uh, stabilization. So uh, clearly, when I saw the data, I said, oh, uh, this is something that's likely going to work. So so it's, it's exciting. So that's another pathway that we need to pay attention, uh, the use of MEC inhibitors in ovarian cancer. There was a study done uh, uh, by the University of Toronto in patients with prostate cancer uh, with metformin. I hate to say, but I'm a breast cancer doctor, and I, I'm learning from my prostate colleagues, and, and mm, great. So we'll have to learn from them, because they did something very smart. So they had a number of patients that were um, had a diagnosis of prostate cancer, and they had to undergo surgery. But before surgery, they treated pa these patients with metformin. And the question that they were asking is, what's happening with tumor growth under metformin for a few weeks just prior to surgery? So they took a biopsy for diagnosis. With these early stage, by the way? Yes. Okay. They start metformin, and then at the time of surgery, they remove the tumor. Mm -hmm. And now they compare what's happening 
with metformin therapy in the tumor prior to therapy and the mm -hmm. tumor after therapy. And they saw that the proportion of patients, uh, the tumors stopped proliferating. So TI67 uh, went down. Now, this is very early days, but I could envision this as a, I, I could envision metformin as something that, or, or, or analogs that could be used one day as a preventive agent for prostate cancer. And imagine a generic drug yeah. it's been around for yeah. so long and yeah. for a whole other application. I hear in the women it causes uh, weight loss. They like that. In yes. the men, too? Yes. And in the women, there is some indication that it might prevent uh, in, uh, breast cancer in women with overweight. So, yes, it does control metabolism. And it could be a preventive agent, very accessible. It's an old compound. It's an old friend. We've had it for many, many years. There's something yeah. comforting about knowing the sort of drug profile and what to expect from something that's been around a long yeah. time. Well, we uh, are beginning now to understand how many, how many compounds that we knew, we thought we knew what they were doing, and we are discovering new mechanisms of action. And the role of metformin in cancer cell metabolism is something that is intriguing, but it's there. Are there any other uh, studies that come to mind or data that were presented here that you want to share with us? Antibodies against cancer have been used for a long time, but what's happening now is that we have better technologies and we can engineer antibodies to do things that um, we never thought were possible. There was a clinical trial presented here with an, by specific antibody that has the capacity to inhibit HER1 on one side, that's the EGF receptor, and HER3 on the other hand, so it's by specific the antigen binding, they have the two uh, antigen binding uh, capabilities. Um, uh, what was presented here is that this dual antibody had dramatic activity in head and neck cancer that was refractory to cetuximab. And not only that, but there was a marker in the tissue, which was the level of ligand called herregulin, that predicted response. So based on this uh, phase to study in head and neck and in colon cancer will be launched. So uh, this meeting to me also has been there for the, uh, if you wish, the coming to life of HER3 therapies as a target uh, for cancer. In a disease that we need uh, therapies such as head and neck, in head and neck since cetuximab, and I know cetuximab very well because I did those studies in patients, uh, but since cetuximab, this was eight years ago, uh, we did not have anything that was exciting. This is exciting, so that's uh, something that I think is worth mentioning. As I listen to you speak about all of this data and these various studies, I can't help thinking about how challenging it must be for the general medical practitioner in the community setting to keep up on the speed at of these advances in our understanding of cancer biologically, how long does this kind of information really take to get into the community and utilized uh, in the way and the speed at which it would happen at the academic university sector? What's happening today and is that our tools to communicate what is going on uh, at different academic sites or in, around the world uh, the communication tools are so much better that uh, I, I have the feeling that in, in, in my interaction with people in the community that they are really, they are really, um, uh, they, they have access to all this information. I think what needs to be made is to create tools that will facilitate, uh, uh, you know, to be on top of this knowledge. And uh, we are giving a lot of thought on to do that, but clearly the best way is going to be that as we go on and sequence these tumors, instead of providing just the results, we are going to need to provide what this result means uh, and what are the potential implications of the result. So we are moving into an era in which just reporting findings uh, is not going to do it. You will have to provide um, the implications of this finding. Not only that, but also we would see this as a continuum. So one thing that we are thinking is, imagine that uh, a physician, uh, I order a test uh, on a patient of mine, and a tumor mutation is found. What is known about this mutation today is different than it will be known six months from now. 
So somehow we will need to feed continuously uh, as new information becomes available what is the implication of the test mm -hmm. that we order on our patients. So we see uh, a process of um, making information available but it's not going to be just one point in time but it's an experience that will go on and and, and that's the only way we are going to be able to, to do it. We spend a lot of time uh, 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 thinking on how are we going to do this even for our own academic physicians. I mean, our even academic colleagues are not going to be able to keep up uh, with all this progress. It's not going to be possible. Yes, and I would imagine the way medical school education is going to proceed, there's going to have to be changes there too. We'll yeah. have to change the curriculum. Exactly. Uh, we'll have to change the way we teach. Uh, maybe instead of teaching uh, knowledge, we'll have to teach process. Uh, we'll have to focus more on uh, the process part of, 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 of the medical care than on the particular knowledge that is going to be so evolving that by the time uh, you learn something, it's going to be already outdated. Outdated, right, uh, exactly. So <laughs> it's, it's going to be a whole different way. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have to align the, the minds of our students uh, differently. And, and, and patients, really, I keep saying this, need to have copies of their clinical information and also as they get their molecular and, and uh, genomic pathology pulled together, they, they really need to own all this information and have well, it at their fingertips. Well, not, not only that, they'll, they'll need to manage it. So mm -hmm. it's not going to be paper copies. They, they, they're going right. to need to have real-time access. Yes, exactly. And they, Patient so health records, absolutely. which are no, different than electronic health records, right. but they're ones that the patient can control. Control, and the question is going to be, what does this mutation mean to me exactly. today? Uh, so you could, uh, I could see a situation in which a patient every month or every few months are going to check what that mutation uh, means. Mm -hmm. And the story is going to be a changing one. I love talking to you because you have this excitement and passion about you. It's palpable. We spent time with you at San Antonio. Yeah. And you had important information to share there. And I'm just curious, when you leave and go back to, to Boston and, and get back into your own um, setting and your own labs with your own staff, where is your research going when you return home? I am right now focused on a variety of projects. These PI3 kinase alpha inhibitors, I want to make sure that we are launching the phase two and the phase three studies so that we get approval of this soon. So that's, that's an urgent focus of my work. Uh, the other work more on the discovery side uh, of, of things is that uh, we are looking at compensatory responses by the tumor that result in resistance. So we have, and others have identified that uh, when you block one pathway, the tumor cells have the capacity to activate other pathways. Uh, if we could find on every tumor what are these compensatory pathways, we could make big uh, progress. So, um, we are working in this. It's terribly exciting. Uh, we are beginning to get some results. And the future thing, two or three years from now, would be that a patient would start on a clinical trial with a compound. A day later, we would do a biopsy, mm -hmm. and then we would identify how to block that pathway in full and that could result in dramatic responses. So that's, that's what we're doing. A real pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Jose Vesalga, Associate Director and Chief of Hematology, Oncology at the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you, Sama. You're the best.